Well, hello there, world. Uh, you're with the Squirrel Squadron. I'm Squirrel, and I have a special guest today, Simon Taylor, who I'm going to introduce shortly. But while people are arriving, uh, let me just give a uh, couple of uh, intro remarks. The first is uh, some people will be arriving on a recording. So we have uh, folks in the squadron from Australia and um, Eastern Europe and uh, Asia and lots of other exciting places. So uh, all of you, hello as well. Uh, everybody who isn't on the recording, if you're here live, uh, please uh, ask questions. Uh, interrupt Simon and me. Unfortunately, you can't shut, stick your hand up. We can't see you. Um, but in the chat of whatever service you're on, uh, we'll be able to see it here. And, and we would love to ask, answer your questions and uh, hear where you disagree with us uh, on the topic of tech strategy, which is today's uh, uh, subject. Um, uh, don't hesitate. Do that. If nobody comments, this will be a shorter stream and I can go walk the dog sooner, which is also fine. But uh, I'm going to have fun talking to Simon no matter what happens. And I see uh, some of you showing up, which is great. So um, uh, I just want to mention what the Squirrel Squadron is. That's my community of tech and non-tech people uh, working and learning together. Simon's in the squadron and uh, I asked him to join us because he has a very interesting story to tell. Uh, there's lots of those and we talk about them all the time on the Squirrel Squadron forum. Um, there, I uh, just looked at the most recent posts. We had one on dealing with fear. Uh, we had another one on where artificial intelligence was going and how it's uh, uh, not uh, being used correctly. And another on internationalizing your software. So uh, we managed to cover the, the full gamut, uh, lots of interesting topics. We also have really great topics every week on events like this. So there are Zoom calls and uh, live streams, um, and there are also live events. And the next one of those is in London on the 22nd of June. And we're going to be uh, not only uh, um, talking about artificial intelligence, but actually using it. And I'm going to tell you why you're using it all wrong. So uh, if you want to join us for that, please come along. Oh, and we're doing a new thing there too, which is a Q&A session. If you show up early, just ask a bunch of questions. I'm going to be sitting there, lots of interesting, smart people um, of the, the caliber of Simon. I don't know if you're coming, Simon, but people like Simon will be there. Um, and uh, we'll all be discussing any topic under the sun relevant to uh, uh, tech, non-tech, business profit, um, and making those things all come together. Fantastic. Um, right. Uh, oh, and we have another one that I'm just putting in for July, by the way, if you're interested in supply chain. I've got an expert for, on supply chain who's going to join us toward the end of July. So lots of exciting events coming. Good stuff. Um, Simon, I don't. Uh, we, I, you uh, phoned me yesterday and you said, si Squirrel, what are we going to talk about? And I said, whatever comes up, we're going to talk about your interesting story. So I, I haven't got done any prep, except I know that we're going to talk about a tech strategy that uh, you worked on with me first. Uh, you came to my workshop. Um, but uh, can you introduce uh, yourself to uh, the, the folks here? Tell us a little bit about your company, what you do, um, and then kind of the broad, the bear, the broad picture. Uh, what was your tech strategy all about? Why did you come talk to me about tech strategy? Sure. So thanks for the introduction, Squirrel. Uh, I'm Simon. I work for a company called Duco. Our mission statement is to enable our customers to be able to trust their mission critical data. What that means is we're in the reconciliations space. Uh, for those that are not familiar, a reconciliation occurs uh, when any kind of financial transaction happens. And there's usually a record of it happening on one side. Uh, and another record of the same thing happening on the other side. And these somebody's are got a credit and somebody's got a debit. Yes. Imagine a bank uh, moving money to another bank, for example. They will have systems that record this stuff completely disparate. They do not talk to each other at all. Uh, a reconciliation occurs when we compare the data from one side with the data from the other. And you would have thought it would all match, except for often it doesn't. Um, a case in point, trades. Uh, I, it blew my mind to, to, to learn that when a trade occurs, there's often a difference of opinion of, of exactly what the price was um, when the trade happened. And it happens a surprising amount of the time. So reconciliations are everywhere. Once you see them, you can't unsee them. So that's the business we're in. Fantastic. And what is your role there? What do you do to make those reconciliations happen? Sure. I, I am an engineering manager for one uh, part of the product and we deal with cash and securities. And that's just another kind of thing that is reconciled. Cash is the easiest example. That's just literally the movement of money. Count the, count, count the pieces of paper. Yes. Probably not anymore, but yeah. <laughs> Something like that. And um, uh, yeah, so it, what, what's significant is, is we learned in November that there was an investment approved in this particular part of the product. And so we were effectively given, given money 
and uh, and we're on that journey now. So it's almost like a scale up within a scale up. Ah, um, nice. Uh, and that leads us directly to the the, the topic of profit. Uh, and how important that is, because for those that are in this world, you'll know that if you're a VC backed company, it doesn't fly unless you're profitable anymore. Um, and so that's that's the space we're in where we're, we're getting to profit. Fantastic. I, I wouldn't say maybe I'm going to disagree with you here. Or I, maybe you'll tell me I'm missing something, an important trend. I haven't seen that European VCs are so focused on uh, profit but they're a huge amount more interested in you actually having a viable business than Americans who will pretty much give you money if you show up in a bathrobe with a, a set of PowerPoints and a cool idea. Um, but the Europeans tend to want you to have a path to profit. I, a lot of my clients are loss making, but they, they don't actually make a profit today. But where, where yeah. are you? We are actually, our, our, our VC is European. So that would probably chime with that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we're on that journey with them. We are we are VC backed, and uh, we're we're in we're in. Uh, in Interested in actually making a viable business, unlike the U.S., where you know I don't know how long Amazon's been loss making, but uh, uh, Uber also you know just more or less buying the traffic uh, by subsidizing the taxis. Essentially, you, you're not getting away with that in fintech in Europe for sure. Nope, nope. You got you got to be turning a profit. So that's that's what that's what we're doing. Makes sense. Okay. And now I know why you came to my um, uh, workshop in November, because you just had a chunk of cash and uh, you needed to figure out what to do with it. It's, it sounds like. Exactly. I think I, should, I, I think I should tell a story. This is a, a technique Please. I learned from school. So there I was doing, doing my normal work on whichever the day, day of the week it was. And I received an email from Squirrel um, saying there was this workshop on uh, driving your tech teams to profit. The words to, the, to, to that. Effect. Yeah, that sounds like me. Go ahead. That was the first hook. I was like, yes, I've got a tech team. We're trying to get to profit. And then further down, there was another hook that got me. And it was, are you drowning in OKRs? And, um, and we absolutely were. Uh, yeah. we, were, we, were we, we had company-wide OKRs, and we were, we were cascading them down to engineering. And we were, we were lots, of, lots of OKR bureaucracy. And so that's really that's, that's what the hook was. Uh, I was like, yes, this is absolutely relevant to what we're doing. It was a half day uh, thing that Squirrel organized. And so I, I, I decided to pitch it to my boss, who said he was come, interested in coming also. Sadly, he couldn't make it in the end. So it was just me that represented uh, Duco. In, in Fantastic. Well, we'll talk more about what you did there in a second. But um... Uh, it sounds like that was was really relevant to you, which is fantastic, and came at the right time, which is uh, really, really useful. Good. Um, folks here, you've all come because you're interested in tech strategy for some reason. You would like to get a, well, I should say what OKR stands for, because not everyone will know, objectives and key results. So if your company doesn't use that, you probably use something else for measuring how somebody's vision of what you should be doing matches up to what people are actually doing every day with their hands on keyboards and their uh, phones pressed to their ears. So the um, uh, thing that Simon's describing is having a mechanism that wasn't really serving him for figuring out how the business was going to get benefit from what uh, his team was doing. We'll talk a lot more about that. But I'd like you to put in the chat, please, so that we can be relevant to you. Uh, what's your uh, issue or question or, or topic? What, what made this interesting? What was the hook for you? Uh, to come and listen to Simon and me talk about uh, his experience with building a tech strategy. Uh, I can tell you for sure, uh, lots of folks in the community, whether or not it's the people here, uh, tell me all the time that they're being asked for a tech strategy, they don't know what it is, and uh, or they have a tech strategy and they don't know what it is, and it's not helping them to achieve their business goals. So uh, that's something we'll talk about is is uh, how how you then used what, what we talked about and what we worked on together to, to change things at Duco. Um, so uh, uh, tell us, uh, we, we'll go back into the workshop, but start me with what happened after. So you said, man, I'm drowning in OKRs. I, 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 I want to get to profit, but that's not really getting me the accountability I need. What did you change when you came out? And you said, okay, I'm going to do something different. Because the reason I invited you here was because you said, yeah, lots of things have been happening. I've been using these ideas, and, and then I haven't found out what they are. I intentionally don't know. So surprise me and the listeners. What, what, what did you do? Sure. As, as Squirrel alludes to, we've not properly debriefed about this yet. So we're, we're kind of going to do it on the call. We'll do it live. Perfect. That's what I um, wanted. Tell me what <laughs> so, worked and what didn't. Well, sure. So, so, so post-workshop, I, I had this moment during, during the workshop where I thought, I must do this. I must, I must rerun this thing internally. 
Um, uh, luckily for me, it, literally one week after the workshop I attended with you, we had um, a team day that was already in the calendar. So I decided to kind of hijack that and turn it into effectively recreating the workshop, re redoing it. Um, Excellent. With, with, I'll, with, I'll send with, you an invoice for the intellectual prep. No, I'm kidding. Go ahead. No, oh, I, I gave you all the credit. I, I even used your your slide with where it said your your name on it and everything. So Good, everyone, excellent. Everyone Copyright squirrel. Everything. Okay, fine. No, it, I, that's exactly what I wanted you to do. So, how did that go? What did what were the results of that? Well, it, it was uh, just leading up to it. I, I it's it's worth um telling the story around that. Great, on, yeah, on tell us. Workshop. I, I I was like, yes, we must. I must do this thing. And 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 then I, I sent out the, uh, the 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 invite, and I took your advice, and I invited everyone. Uh, Squirrel's advice was don't hold back, just invite everyone. So I invited people from marketing, from sales, from operations, other people from engineering, everyone. Like I, I invited everyone. You get all the voices in the room, so then nobody says, "Hey, I, you didn't take, take me into account. I'm not going to buy into this. I'm not going to uh, take it on and help you because you didn't ask me." So it's much better to have all the voices in the room and deal with them on the spot. Absolutely, and that, and that's what happened. But um, post sending out the invite, I went through this kind of valley of despair. I was like, oh, mate, what if this whole thing just falls flat on its face and I look like a fool? I was like, you know, but I was like, I was committed at that point. So um, so so we did it, and I, I good for I, you. I, I, yeah, and I, I recreated the, the workshop, and I actually studied the video recording that we had of that day. Um, so I, I had it all planned, and we we did all the things. Um, uh, and so, yeah, where do you want to go with this now? Talk about well, great. Well, I was looking for what the ultimate results are because I, I want people to hear why it's valuable before they hear what it is, um, because they need to decide oh. whether this is valuable for them. So, after you've done those things, what were the results? What were the benefits or costs? You know, what what went well or didn't once you had taken people through the elements, which we're going to get to in a minute. Sure. So, the, the, I mean, the output was uh, we had a napkin strategy for our for our company, which we will come we'll to. We'll explain what that is in a second. Yeah, keep going. And we we, we formulated a technology strategy, or at least a, a first iteration of. Um, it was well received, um, though it wasn't quite what people were expecting on, on the day. But that's probably a good thing. I think partic particularly the marketing folks were hoping for their, the output to be something more like a Gantt chart and some some hard dates of when they're going to get certain features, and it wasn't that. And Good. that's not a bad thing. Yes. Um, but what, else? what, yep. you, what I would have expected is you would get accountability so that um, for things that did have dates, you would be saying, I'm accountable for getting this done by this date. And for things that don't, but maybe come in an order, you say, I'm accountable for making sure that these things happen in this order. And that would include the marketing people, right? They've got to make sure that they understand what they're going to market, communicate to that to you in enough time for you to build it. Did you get that level of accountability? Yeah, we did. We did. It was. It was. And I think the 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 wording of it is interesting. Joint design, right? And that that's so pertinent because that's really what it was. And I think the value from it was from having everyone in the room and everyone feeling like they had a voice when we were coming to this thing together. So it truly was a a joint design of a strategy. What was also interesting as well was a lot of people weren't. Ex expecting to be invited to help formulate a technology strategy. You know, that's not their thing, their, their sales, their marketing. Um, however, by incorporating everyone in that and doing it together in the room, there was this buy-in. Um, we subsequently iterated on that strategy a few times, and we've, we've now got something different, but not too dissimilar from the original one. Um, but overall, it was fantastic. Um, yeah, so what would you like to zoom in on now? Well, I just want to pull out a couple of things. Well, by the way, all the uh, dogs in the neighborhood are busy barking, and uh, they're excited about technology strategy and joint design, too. Um, so apologies to listeners if they're distracted by dogs. But the, um, the two things I picked out from what you said is that having the joint design was surprising. The marketing people didn't expect they'd be helping to build a technology strategy, but valuable because you brought in more ideas. And then you've been able to iterate that. So you've been able to keep changing it 
because um, you may be in a, a, a maybe a, a quiet backwater of fintech, but man, that's that world is still changing at an incredible rate. And I imagine you're getting new investments, new opportunities, and needing to change your strategy. So you've got a mechanism for doing that, which is fantastic. And that's yeah. not something I taught you. I didn't particularly go into that. I didn't have enough time in half a day to talk about how you um, do an ongoing process. So let's make sure we come back to that because uh, maybe we'll, we'll put that in a future workshop. That would be great. By the way, this isn't to sell a workshop. So uh, I will do this workshop again. I'll put that on the forum uh, when we're done. But um, I just really thought everyone would benefit from hearing uh, hearing your story. Cool. So um, uh, let's go through the elements then. So uh, we talked about something called the, the X strategy, the X framework, um, just because I'm not very creative or didn't feel creative when I came up with it. Um, so and I don't even have a drawing of it here. So I'm just going to do it with an X uh, with my arms. Uh, so everybody knows what an X looks like. And at the center is your tech strategy. That's where the two uh, um, slashes meet. Um, but above is understanding your uh, business strategy. That's the napkin strategy we'll talk about in a minute. And um, your tech assets. And we talked about a way to understand what those were. Bring those together in a tech strategy. Then you need to execute on the strategy and make, make that work. This is now we're at the bottom of the X. And uh, on the other final leg is the accountability, which we just uh, talked about and which you've done so well. So those are the five elements that we talked about, and we, we went into some depth on each one. Um, let's talk first about uh, the napkin strategy. So um, uh, but the reason I talk about a, a napkin as a good place for your strategy to go is because it's tiny. And um, since then, as I've taught more people about this, I was uh, uh, doing this with some Germans. And they said, oh, actually, Squirrel, we have something else in Germany. We have a beer deckle. And a beer deckle is a beer coaster. It's a circular thing that you um, put your your uh, beer stein on. And uh, uh, they said, uh, yeah, when we have ideas in the pub, naturally a place that Germans spend a lot of time, just like us in Britain, uh, and they uh, write it on the back of their beer deckle. So uh, the uh, point of having your strategy fit on a napkin is it shows that you, and it actually creates a greater understanding when people have 60-page uh, uh, strategy documents, I've seen 100 um, slide decks full of uh, sound and lights and dancing bears and other things, and it just obscures what you're trying to do. If your strategy is um, move from smaller banks to larger banks and uh, expand in Europe, I just did that in uh, the, the space that would fit on a napkin or a beer deckle, right? I didn't need to use more information. And I would have obscured it if I had done it with all kinds of sound and lights. So that's why I talk about um, uh, compressing to a napkin. The other good thing about a napkin is it forces you to define your negative space, the things you're not going to do. And those are just as important as the things you are because it tells, for example, you, Simon, hey, wait a minute, we're not going to worry about scaling to uh, millions of transactions or billions. I don't know what volume you're at today. We're not worrying about getting larger. We're worrying about doing more of them. We're worried about doing more banks, more clients. But per client, we're doing the same amount. And that makes a huge difference for your technology team. They, they can build in a very different way for one type of strategy that um, uh, uh, blocks out something that says, this is what we're not going to do, than for another one that says, let's do everything, everything in the kitchen sink. And all of us engineers have heard that over and over again. We know as soon as someone says, do everything, we're in a lot of trouble. It means somebody hasn't made good decisions. So um, now don't tell us your secrets at Duco. Don't, uh, you know, not everyone watching this is, uh, has signed an NDA, but can you share a little bit of what your napkin strategy looks like or how you got there? Yeah, sure. I mean, I'll show, I don't mind sharing the, the strategy itself. That's, there's there's oh, great. no secret. It's, okay, it's, it's, super. To make it super easy for, sorry, make it easy for super massive institutions to prove that the, the, the sum of things equals the delta of stuff, which is actually effectively what a reconciliation is. Of course, just like you said, get the bits over here to match up to those. I like I like that phrasing. That's really nice. Did you come up with that, Simon? Was that the group in the joint design process? How did that, how did you come up with a, that language? It was, of course, the group. We, we did it together. And the, the bit that has really stuck is the supermassive institutions. We still talk about supermassive institutions as this kind of collection of organizations that we're going after. Um, these are, you know, tier one banks, names you would recognize, um, asset managers, fund managers. These are the kind of companies that we're going after now with the product. And it really framed it. And it's, we, 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 we still refer back to it now. So that, that was our, it was, it, the feedback I got was that it was not in a negative way. It was pithy. But that's kind of the point of the of the napkin strategy, right? You got it. 
exactly because now you can recite that and I, I didn't see that you were reading it off a screen but even if you were you, you could probably say almost all those words without reading something yeah. and so could everybody in your company and that's the benefit of having your company strategy by the way we haven't talked about tech strategy yet this is the business strategy we'll get to the tech strategy that you need as an input what the heck is the business trying to do and the fact that everybody can know what it is then makes this whole process of accountability much simpler and you stop drowning in okrs so many of my clients have these very Byzantine complicated systems with scoring and, and numbers, and it takes them two months to start the quarter, by which time the quarter is over. Uh, it's crazy stuff that they do to do something very simple, which is, have we gone for these supermassive banks, for example? And supermassive is a very um, evocative term, which anybody can measure pretty easily. And you can tell very quickly that uh, Squirrel's Bank is not super massive because it consists of Squirrel and some of his friends, and it's a neighborhood bank. It's not the right one for us. You might not be sure whether JP Morgan is or isn't, but you know that they're in the right category. So you can know that you're on the right track if you're talking to them. Squirrel's bank, not so much. JP Morgan, definitely. Do we need uh, very large volumes of transactions? Well, definitely. Are they going to be global? Well, for sure, because these are bulge bracket banks that are operating around the world. These kind of questions become very simple for someone to answer if you can boil it all down to something very compressed that fits on a napkin. Okay, fantastic. Then how, how did you assess your tech assets? Yes, so I'm gonna to refer to another screen I've got here Great. to remind myself. Yeah, so we did the technology assets radar assessment. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's like a line and a line and another line Yep. And it's a we, little spider diagram if people know what that looks like. We're not trying to do visual aids here, but um, uh, uh, it will be on, by the way, I will put that up on the um, follow-up forum post uh, so people can see it. So if you're in the Squirrel Squadron forum, and if you're not, you should be, uh, go and have a look on the post that will come out tomorrow summarizing what we talk about. Keep going, Simon. So how did you use that spider diagram to assess yourself in six different areas? Sure. So the, the six different areas were uh, seniority, leadership, product fit, cycle time, testing, and monitoring. And the way we did that in the room is we introduced what each of those things were, what they meant. Uh, and actually in the room, we did um, kind of like hand voting. Um, uh, and and, and it, was, it surprised the non-technical people to, to, to be asked about what they thought of our testing strategy or our cycle time, for example. Yeah, well, um, the poor person in customer service sure does care about how many bugs you have and has a much closer feeling for that often than the engineers. Yes, uh, and so we did that. We did the hand voting thing when it was, it was, and the output was this diagram with some numbers on it, but the outcome was the, the conversations we had um, around those things, and, 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 they were, and they were super valuable. I think a bit of feedback would be the more people you have in the room, the more likely the uh, the number is to average to something in the middle. I of think course. That's, um, so yeah. a lot of us... The point, the point isn't exactly what the numbers are. The point exactly, as you say, is to get people talking about it and thinking about where they fit. And then that leads into the strategy, uh, which then tells us how we're going to change that. Because you may average out to a number, but everybody says there's something wrong in testing. There's, there's got to be something wrong because customer service sees too many bugs. Developers are spending too much time on them. Marketing says they can't um, uh, demonstrate to customers something's wrong here and we need to do it. Whether we think it's a four or a two, we got something to do. Right. Uh, another really important one was talking about cycle time. Now, I think cycle time is difficult because it's a bit of a loaded term. It can mean different things in different contexts. You know, So we, I, I, I went with, with the squirrel definition, which is the average period of time between consciously deciding that we're going to have this thing and it being in the hands of our customers, right? You got it. And so often people may be familiar, I just wanna make sure people don't get confused. There's a, a, a thing you can get from your JIRA system, your system that tracks bugs and tickets and tasks that developers do. Ignore that because that's what a computer measures. What you need is something that's passed through a human's brain and the human says, well, this is when we really started. I know we put it in JIRA two months before that, but the time when we really started was here. And I know we marked it done, but actually it had so many bugs, we couldn't release it to the customer for an extra three months after that. So that tells you a very different number and a very different understanding. It's more um, subjective, but subjective is the point. 
keep going. Right. How, how how did you uh, how did you rate on that? Well, not not highly, and it was it was, and we actually died in a separate session. I actually did um body stream mapping exercise. Also, so, a really valuable idea. Keep going. To actually map that out and try and put some 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 numbers on it. Um, and if for anyone that's done body stream mapping, it's where you you visualize the sequence of things. And for each of the things, you say how long that thing takes, and then there's this notion of um, how much useful time is actually spent doing it as a proportion of the total elapsed time, and then there's the time between the stages. But whatever, that's a, that's a, that's a way to illustrate the fact that actually in our context, it was a, a long time, I'm talking months, um, between someone deciding they want the thing and it actually being usable by a customer. And so that was very pertinent, and that's actually something we're still uh, working on uh, right now. Um, but yeah, it's extremely, extremely useful. Again, the 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 outcome, the conversations, were 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 the uh, were the were the, uh, the, the 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 biggest value we got from it. Oh, fantastic! Now, from that, from the assessment of what you had and where you were trying to go, you you would have come up with something, and I always recommend it fits on a page that describes what your strategy is. Now, again, yes. don't tell us any secrets, um, but what was the process like to come up with that? Uh, what, how are you realizing that and sharing that with, with other people? Sure, so we did subsequent iterations and we, we, we spent time as a team uh, talking about this stuff. And we, I won't go into too many of the details, but we, we figured out that there were really three objectives um, that we were trying to move the dial on, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And we actually arranged ourselves in sub teams to focus on these three things. Um, uh, yeah, can I, can I say much more than that? No, that's, that's probably about what about as enough. much as yeah. now. Don't but tell it, us any secrets, absolutely. But you, you it, were able to divide your, your world into three different areas and only three. Notice it's not 300, it's not uh, many slides, it's not um, uh, a Gantt chart uh, in JIRA that somehow shows what you're going to be doing on August the 29th. It's a, a one pager that you can summarize. You can say, well, this team's going to focus on this outcome, this one on that one, and this one on that. And then the crucial thing, which I'm sure, because I know you, Simon, you would have done this, is that that then ties back to the business strategy. So you'd say, Absolutely. this is something, exactly, something that super massive um, fin institutions, I, I'm enjoying that term, that those fin institutions need, and they've asked us for one of these, and they've asked us for one of these, but we're going to do it differently. And there's this bit that we need to do in order to service them well, for example. And we understand how those all add up to making sure that they can match the um, sum of this against the sum of that. Uh, and as, as long as you can do that, you're in great shape. I used to play a game with the, uh, the I can't remember if I told this story at the session, Simon. I used to play a game with my um, staff, the, the team that worked at, under me, when I sold to these super massive institutions. We also sold, we called them bulge bracket banks, but it was the same group. And the game I would play with my engineers was I would walk up to them and I'd say, we're going to play the why game. Only I can lose the why game. Don't feel bad. So if you, if you don't get the right answers, it's, you're not in trouble. It's me that's in trouble because I want to know if you know how what you're doing is tied to profit. And so uh, I would ask them, what are you doing? And they'd say, well, I'm uh, adding this new monitoring. And I'd say, so why are you doing that? Well, because it was in JIRA. And uh, why are you? Why was it in JIRA? Well, <laughs> often that was where they fell down and said, I don't know. And then I had to go communicate better. But in good cases, they would say, well, it's in JIRA because the product manager prioritized it because they talked to the customer and they need better monitoring. Why do they need better monitoring? Well, if our systems goes down, go down, they lose money. Why are our systems vital to them? And why are they part of their workflow? Then they could give a business case for why uh, our systems meant money in the pockets of our customers. And when you can get all the way back there, all the way back to the napkin strategy in as few steps as possible, then you've got a very clear tech strategy that is um, uh, feeding the business outcomes. And you can have great accountability, which we'll, we'll, I keep saying we're going to come to that. It's, it's the, the fifth item. So be, be patient, everybody. Um, so uh, uh, that game helped me develop these ideas and helped me uh, see how my team was doing against uh, the tech strategy. But the key thing was that we had to have it in the first place. We had to understand that these items that we were working on were not just because they were good practices or not because we saw them at a conference somewhere or because Squirrel says to do them. It was because um, they were feeding some uh, business result. And yeah, it sounds it's, it's, like that's what you were able to do too. 
it's curious how easy it is for engineers to become detached from profit. Um, oh, yes. in, in sort of larger, more siloed organizations where engineers are there to write code. Um, someone else worries about the profit. Um, and that is, of course, a, a massive anti-pattern. And that's, I guess, what all of this stuff is trying to address. Absolutely. So how did your team do at writing code that matched these results? Again, please don't tell us any business secrets, but um, are, are they able to follow the tech strategy? Were there obstacles in the way? How, how was the execution? No, the execution is good and it's, on, and it's ongoing. And, and the, maybe that's a segue to talk about the indicators and uh, how, how we can measure the, uh, the value of what we're actually Absolutely. delivering. We're finally getting over into accountability. That's great. So you're going to tell us using the accountability what, what results you saw to the degree you can. Uh, go ahead. So what indicators did you come up with? So well, the, the, the first thing to do is to actually talk about what these indicators were, are, and why, why we should measure them. And it, 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 it's obviously a, a theme about metrics. And very you know lots of organizations worry about how many story points they're delivering. Um, and uh, I think that, that, that's, that's, that's fine. Maybe there's some value in that. But as an alternative uh, way, what, what, what can we measure based on what's actually been delivered to move the dial? Um, now, for us, we're doing it sprintly. I know that there's an aspiration to do it more frequently than that. Um, but we're, we're using indicators to do that across these three sub teams. So the idea is sprint by sprint. If we built something and deployed it, was there a measurable change that we were looking for? Um, and so that would be generally the leading indicators, the thing that we can move the dial on sprint by sprint. And then the lagging indicators are the ones that take a lot, a lot longer. And the leading indicators are generally proxies for, for, for lagging indicators often. Exactly. Now, Simon's using very standard industry terminology. I have my own kind of squirrel te terminology for this, which I think we used in the session, which is imperfect indicators. Mm -hmm. And the reason I do that specifically is because, and I use that term, is because I want you thinking about indicators that are sloppy and wrong, because those are likely to be ones that you can do quick. And that's the value. So one of my favorite silly examples, um, but it really has helped me, um, is that I weigh myself every morning. And uh, that's a terrible indicator because you, your, your water in your body changes and you know what time of day it is exactly and so on. There's huge numbers of factors that change your weight. Um, but it is a basic indicator that you can get very frequently and that tells me, am I on track to lose weight? Well, I lost about uh, three stone and um, I, I've gained a bit back, so I need to work a bit more on that. So, uh, but it's a constant measure for me of where I am. And in the same way, you can measure something like, um, were we able to increase the speed of our, uh, you know, our throughput of transactions? Can we do more transactions? Can we reconcile more today? Um, I'm guessing at what Simon's indicators are and you don't have to confirm Simon, that's fine. But that would be the kind of indicator you might do there might be a variation in how many transactions there were today. Market was very volatile. There's a lot more transactions to reconcile. Market wasn't so volatile, not so many. But if our throughput keeps going up over time and we can keep seeing that it's improving each sprint, we must be on the right track to serving bigger and bigger, more super massive um, institutions. Simon, am I basically on track? I'm, I'm trying not to um, <laughs> give away any of your secrets, but uh, is no, that no, the sort of thing you're measuring? Absolutely. What bit of feedback actually was when I, I spoke a lot about imperfect indicators, mm -hmm. and it never quite landed. Ah, as soon, interesting. As soon as I as soon as I spoke spoke about leading and lagging, everyone was just like light bulb. Okay, I get it. Okay, that's so, more so standard. That reason we we well, I talk about the leading indicators rather than the imperfect indicators. Okay. Well, and you use the language that works. I'm never going to object to that. I'm trying to get people's attention, and I think it was helpful to you, I hope, mm -hmm. in understanding that your leading indicator, whatever it is, should be wrong. And, and that's really hard for people to get. Don't I want the right indicator? Don't I want to know exactly what's right? Oh, look, it'll take me a month to measure it, but then I'll know the right number. Yeah, but you can't react in a month, right? You can't react only every month. You want to react every week, every two weeks, every day, whatever speed it is. And that's much more valuable than getting the perfect academic result uh, that tells you how badly you're doing. 
Uh, it's not always that helpful. We have a question which I want to make sure to uh, uh, look at here. Florian, hi Florian, very nice to see you. Asks, um, uh, as a, it's too long to put on the screen. I'm sorry, so I'll read it out. As a company, we have set OKRs to expand our business. While we are prepared to do so from a product perspective, we have encountered significant challenges on the technical side. We are not adequately prepared technologically to align with our company's strategic goals. How do you suggest addressing this situation? Our engineers are co currently feeling pulled in multiple directions. Hey, Simon, this sounds familiar. Um, on one, one hand, they are focused on building innovative and impressive products. While on the other hand, now I'm running out. Florian's uh, written so much it actually doesn't come through, but I think we get the idea. So uh, what, would, what should we do when uh, we're not lined up? Uh, our assets don't match up with the uh, business strategy. So, um, Simon, did you have that situation or did you find that your assets were actually in, in good shape for handling what the, the napkin said you should do? Um, no, we, we found that there were things that didn't align. And I guess I, I think you'd be in a very fortunate spot if you found that your assets did align. Um, I suspect you've done this more than I have, Squirrel, that um, you, you see a difference more often than not. Almost always. It can be a big difference or a small difference. Sometimes people have got it really right for a long time. They've built the right skills. They've done something or they've got lucky. And, and it means that they're pretty closely aligned. But much more commonly, uh, they're, they're dealing with ancient code that was written actually for a really different product. They're trying to make it fit into a, a, a model that uh, doesn't uh, match its assumptions anymore. And uh, they're really having a struggle getting their engineering to work. I have a bias, of course, because people tend to bring me in to help them with that situation. So I see that more often. Uh, but even when I'm doing due diligence and uh, health checks and, and checking on a company that might be doing well, uh, I still see that there are um, mismatches there. What did you do about the mismatches? So uh, you found some. Uh, tell us to whatever degree you can. Um, uh, what did you do about that? And, and how did you uh, how are you addressing it? Sure. I mean, it's again, I think it just starts with discussions and surfacing it and getting a consensus that this is something that we want to improve. Um, I don't think there's any more magic to it than that, other than, you know, verbalizing it, agreeing that we need to do something differently and then doing it. So uh, I'll add to that. Simon's absolutely right that keeping it simple is very valuable. And if you try to, again, um, you know, let's, let's call in a complicated, um, uh, intervention from some consultancy, uh, which is going to completely remake our OKRs, hoping that somehow we'll perform better. I've, I've seen that end tragically far too often. But you don't only need to keep it simple. What's also really valuable is to make sure that you can tie the technological assets you have to their benefits to the business. And if you can take something that um, you know, you've made a choice to implement on uh, uh, your application so that it runs on mobile uh, devices and not on desktops, that might suit you really well if you're on the factory floor. Uh, I was working with a client who does that today. But if you're dealing mostly with people in offices, they're going to have desktops on their machine, on their on their desks. So um, if you understand your market and who you're selling to, and in Simon's case, it's these uh, super massive institutions. I'm going to take every chance I can to say that phrase. It's so much fun. Um, uh, if it's those folks, um, mobile is going to be less relevant to most of them, but maybe not to salespeople. Um, and it's uh, you're going to need uh, quite a lot of processing power. You can rely on people having powerful desktops on their computers. That's a very simple example of um, the kind of mismatch you might have. Then what are you going to do about that? You're going to need to apply resources to that. You're going to need to jointly design a plan which allows people to shift their skills, their uh, resources, their, um, their plans, and their actions to match where you want to go. So, uh, Florian, please ask more about that. Uh, but it seems to me that you've rec you've done the, the biggest piece of the work, which is to recognize the problem. You say, man, we have a mismatch here. We have these skills over here and this delivery plan over there, and they ain't matching. Uh, you may need Florian. I don't know where you sit in the organization. I think I know you, but I'm not sure either that you're the right Florian. I don't want to assume. Um, and it drives me to the end. I can't see you or chat back and forth to you. But um, uh, Florian, uh, the, uh, depending on where you are, you may be able to act yourself and bring in contractors, um, uh, train people in the right skills, something like that, uh, so that they have the right resources uh, and there isn't a mismatch, or you may need to escalate it. Both of those are good things to do, and we can talk more about how to do that execution and accountability, uh, if that would be interesting. Great question. Um, we've got a bunch more. Uh, oh, two more from Adelina. 
Let's again, too long to, to put up on the screen. So let's see if I can do them. Oh, Adeline is answering Florian and says, uh, job of the CTO or VP engineering to manage and mitigate tech debt and its impact on the business. So there's a lot more than tech debt to cover, but certainly tech debt is uh, one of the things that people talk about where your technology is not well built, not well suited uh, because it historically hasn't. Somebody's taken a shortcut. The shortcuts can be really valuable. Uh, so uh, how come engineering is not aligned with the company's strategic goals? Where was the CTO spokesperson for engineering when the company was setting its strategy? Uh, my answer to that, Adelina, is I don't care because I don't have a time machine. So I can't go back in time and say, why didn't the CTO care? Why didn't we intervene? Why didn't we do more? Now, it can be useful to learn a lesson from that to say, hey, wait a minute, we screwed it up before. We want to not make the same mistake again. That can be useful. And I'd be interested, Adelina, if you have an example of that. Asking, why was the CTO asleep at the switch? Can't tell whether he or she was. Whether that's the situation, I'd, I'd be less focused on that. And Simon, I think one thing we certainly worked on was being very forward-looking and, and always looking for what can we do in our strategy? What can we change today? Uh, if, if we're spending a lot of time trying to figure out what went wrong, that's it's useful to do a little bit, little bit of that. So we avoid the mistake. More than that, I wouldn't do. Simon, what's your experience? Um, yeah, that you know, there's there's just limited value in <laughs> trying to figure out what 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 went wrong. It's you know, the definite focus on 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 the journey ahead. Um, yeah. Okay. Well, Adelina, I hope that's helpful, but please argue with us. Um, we'd, we'd love discussion and debate. That's what the Squirrel Squadron is all about. So I think I've covered, there are a couple of repeats here, but I want to, I think I've covered questions that we've got coming in. So let me come back to Simon then. Um, something we didn't talk about quite as much as I wanted to is this bit in the middle that Simon, you led with, you said this was the, the real game changer. This really made the difference was getting all the people in the room and using a joint design process. So there's actually a theory behind this. There's a, a process you use rather than just shove them in a room and hope they agree. So uh, what was your understanding of that? How did it work for you? And how, where did it maybe not work as well? Yeah, so as, as mentioned, the, the, the advice was to invite everyone to the joint design uh, ceremony, which I did. Um, it, there, were, there, were, there were lots of people in the room um, and yeah, so I, I, also, as mentioned, it wasn't necessarily what everyone was expecting. So maybe this is something, I don't know, if I was going to do this again, would, would you would you recommend doing more scene setting? I didn't really say much about what was going to happen. I just wanted to do it on the day and really give very little um, hints about what was going to happen. Do you think that That's was it. a bad idea or would you, would you, would you have like an agenda? No, I, I, would, I wouldn't necessarily, I might share um, a, a brief outline at the beginning, but we don't need slides and slides of agendas with dancing lights and fancy, fancy uh, uh, bears and things. We, we don't need anything like that. That would be a silly investment of your time, Simon. I'd much rather you were preparing and talking to people and getting a consensus uh, built, at least in your head, about what sorts of issues we we're going to raise rather than trying to uh, control everything, make sure you know exactly who's going to be where, like a precision dance troupe. No, that, that's not needed uh, as part of joint design. So uh, I'm glad you didn't do that. But uh, what I would expect is that the um, uh, people who are participating in the discussion come with their own ideas and thoughts. You know, you and I didn't try to uh, set this up ahead of time so that we'd come to a certain conclusion. Uh, and you, I wouldn't suggest you do that with the people that you're designing a uh, business strategy or a tech strategy with. I would give them some impression of what the outcome will be. So we're going to have something, and we'll decide together on what its format is, but we're going to have something that tells us clearly what our technology folks are going to do and what they're going to ignore, uh, that gives them a way to um, take action on those things and a way for the rest of us to uh, uh, see an account, to understand what is it they're doing and how are they doing it for us. For example, in your case, Simon, you're doing something every sprint, and every sprint I'm imagining you're saying, I'm moving these needles. I'm moving these indicators. And because you did that with the people who were in the room and it was a broad group, then marketing shouldn't say, uh, well, wait a minute. We don't know what's happening over there in tech. Or they just haven't got our stuff done. What they should be able to say is, well, tech isn't doing our stuff and they aren't helping us with our big product launch. But that's because they're dealing with this important issue of um, uh, high volatility in the market that's leading to a lot more volume. And so we've shifted, we're moving in, in the direction of this greater volume. 
And that means we've had to put back some of our things. So the result is someone gets disappointed, but they're disappointed helpfully. They understand what uh, changes, what issues have come up and how that fits into the broader strategy rather than just saying, oh, well, there goes those tech people again. They're doing their own thing. So yeah. uh, go ahead. Uh, unsurprisingly, the, the technologists in the room were a lot more vocal about the technology strategy. And I think that's probably like a facilitation thing, um, getting the quiet people to speak. Um, it's absolutely vital. Um, yeah. it, solicit um, opposing views is one that has always helped me enormously when I'm in those situations, because I'm often facilitating and bringing the group together, just as you were, Simon. And uh, what I want is for people who are in the room to say, uh, I had some ideas about this. I'm no technology expert, but I did see that uh, this was more important than that. Everybody heard me about that. We're going to do this one first. We may not get to the second one that I would still really like, but I was part of the decision. I wasn't left out. Uh, I, I have an understanding of why technology folks are planning to work on A, B, and C and not D, E, and F, and I'm ready to support it. Uh, a, a tool I often use, I don't know if you needed this one or not, Simon, is to, to tell people, well, look, we're going to make a decision here. We've appointed a decision maker. It's often me, or in your case, Simon, might be you. Uh, and um, uh, the decision maker has decided something. If it doesn't work out well in the next sprint or two, in the next month or so, uh, I will buy all of you a beer. But I want you all to try it. And typically what you find is when you've included them, when you've solicited opposing views, um, when you've asked people to explain what important words mean, for example, so that the, the language is clear. You know, I did uh, OKRs, explain that's objectives and key results. All of those sorts of things then make people in the room feel that they are participating, which is very important. And they actually participate. They tell you, uh, here's the bit that you're missing. This matters to us over in customer service. Uh, you know, the kinds of transactions that often don't reconcile are these ones. You should do something about that. And when you get that kind of input, uh, you get much more willingness on the team to uh, act. And they're much more willing to be accountable to say, yeah, we missed this one. This is an item we should improve. We're going to do it next sprint. Is that what you're finding, Simon? Are you finding something different? What are you seeing? No, no, that's basically it, finding that. Fantastic. Okay. Now, uh, we're coming around toward the end. We've got some great questions. Please ask more. Um, uh, very good ones from Florian and Adelina so far. Um, but my uh, maybe penultimate question to you, Simon, is uh, uh, what was this evolution process like? So I, I gave you kind of a framework and a net, uh, this X method for um, sort of understanding where you were going, figuring out how to be accountable for it. Um, but then you've shifted the strategy since then. Uh, how did you do that? What did you shift? Um, and uh, how, how did, did that work out for you? Yeah, sure. So we we arranged ourselves into these three teams aligned with three outcomes. We then reran the strategy exercise uh, with each of those three sub teams. Oh, nice. Um, uh, but obviously, kind of with the the strategy above. Um, yes. So you and had that, more of a framework, had more guidance, but yeah. you knew what you could shift. Oh, nice. And how did that well, work? A bit more granular to the work of the of the, of the three sub teams but on, on the technology strategy, right? The, mm -hmm. the overarching business within the business strategy remained the same. But Great. the um, technology strategy was um, split out for each of these um, three teams. I get it. And how often are you revisit, revisiting it and adjusting? Uh, once a quarter at the moment. Uh, mm -hmm. I have no idea whether that's a sensible cadence. It's just what we've fallen into. Well, you, you'll find out because um, if you're doing it uh, too frequently, then you'll often find there's nothing to change because your environment has stayed the same. That's rare. Free, free, few times have I seen people do it too frequently. What's much more common is they say, oh, great, we're done with strategy now. We don't have to touch that again. And they haven't got a lightweight process like the one you followed, Simon, so that they, they and the one that kind of energizes people, gets them involved and, and excited about where technology is going. They say, oh, my God, I don't want to do that again. <laughs> Let's stay away from that for another year or more. Whereas you've uh, followed really good practices, it sounds like. You've got people interested and willing to keep coming back and to do it for three different teams. So you're doing something right. Yeah, absolutely. It's been well received. Um, and yeah, the, the journey continues. 
Fantastic. Well, Adelina has another question for us, which brings us on to a really good topic. Uh, so she says, and great, I love it when people disagree. She's saying, hey, wait a minute, Squirrel, we got to understand how we got here. Because if the CTO is uh, new to being a CTO or doesn't know how to negotiate or anybody in the leadership team isn't interacting, that's my addition, um, then it's harder to start addressing the issues if they go back to the reason why they happened in the first place. Adelina, you're absolutely right. People have a tendency to say, well, wait a minute, this went wrong then. We better understand that first. But um, my co-author, Jeffrey, taught me a wonderful concept, which I will pass on to all of you. And that is, it's very good to have a theory of abundance about errors. And this came up for him and me when we worked together on the same uh, company serving the supermassive uh, institutions. Um, the the uh, issue was that uh, we had outages and problems. We weren't delivering to our customers. And we did a root cause analysis. We wanted to find out what are some causes that we can remove. That was a good thing to do. It was a limited investment in finding out what the causes were. And sometimes I would come back to Jeffrey and I'd say, man, Jeffrey, we're not getting to everything here. There's more causes. There's more things we could eliminate. We could be more efficient. Jeffrey, being very wise, would turn to me and say, Squirrel, we'll screw that up again. Don't worry. That error will come back again. We were looking for errors in log files, but it also happens in errors in customer service or errors in operations or in sales, You know, not reconciling correctly, whatever it is those problems are going to come back. So Adelina, I'd say absolutely, it's very helpful to understand what's going wrong. It can be helpful to understand the past. It can give you a bit of a guide. I'm happy to look back, but I'd be much more interested in probably the error will happen again, and therefore we can look at it again. That's how Jeffrey would always put it. He'd say, you know, this. we looked into this outage and we, we figured out that this thing went wrong. That's okay, because although there are seven other things that went wrong and we didn't look at those, there'll be another outage and we can start working on the first two of those uh, at that time. And then we'll fix the next two after that. So uh, it, it's very helpful to think about the problem that you're having as one that's likely to recur, not because you want it to recur or because it's fun when it recurs, but it means it gives you a chance to fix it. So that would be my suggestion is absolutely look at issues like poor negotiation or um, uh, inexperience, uh, but those are going to show up every day. Find the example from yesterday, find the example from today. That's going to be much more valuable than kind of looking back. Six months ago, we hired the wrong person. And 12 months before that, uh, we went down the wrong road and we uh, partnered with the wrong company. That's nice to know. But are we making that mistake today? Because we probably are. Anyway, that's my view. Uh, Florian comes back and says, uh, re he read a uh, definition of key results, clear responsible party, one single person or team responsible for key result. And he says he got that from GitLab. Would we agree? Or uh, if not, why not? So, uh, Simon, you're, you're I think, not the world's greatest fan of OKRs. I'm definitely not. Um, but th this is, yeah, me too. They can be valuable used right. Uh, what do you think about um, having a clear responsibility, uh, clear responsible party uh, for the things that uh, you want to get done? Do you use that for the indicators? How, how do you make sure those indicators are headed up and to the right? It's a, it's a good question. Um... It's probably something that would, it would help us to have a more clearly responsible party for. But on, on the question of the indicators and, and the dashboard, the question of you, Squirrel, having done this many times with many clients, how many of them actually build a working dashboard and keep using it? Because again, the, the outcome of the conversation around the dashboard is valuable, but the output, the dashboard itself, how many people actually stick with that and refer back to it over time? It's a great question, and it goes directly to Florian's point, which is I'm less concerned about whether we have a kind of a ritual which creates a clearly responsible party for each one. It's even capitalized. You know, it feels like it's going to be on a form soon. You know, who is the clearly responsible party? And you sign it in triplicate. And it feels bureaucratic to me, which I never find useful for these, because the bureaucracy is either um, respect, either it happens, but it's not respected. So the, the they do fill it in triplicate and then throw it away. So there's a dashboard that no one looks at. Or it's not respected. People say, oh, yeah, that's that thing we fill in once a quarter and, um, you know, we just put down whatever because nobody ever looks at it. And if you're in that situation, that sounds a bit like uh, Florian's definition here. Not, not yours, Florian, but the, the GitLab definition. I, I would worry that that's getting awfully bureaucratic. What I want is a norm within the team uh, that Simon described, and you illustrated it really nicely, that the, the, the team is thinking about, and you have each sub-team working on their separate area. That's one way to do it. Um, but if you, if you do it your way, Simon, each one has an area, they're accountable for that area. 
and somebody from marketing who was in the joint design session can come along and say, you know, how are you doing on making it faster? Because I'm trying to uh, put up a demo. I'm trying to make a video here to send to potential customers. And this thing's dog slow. Why isn't it getting faster? Now, that may be an unfriendly conversation. That might not be a, a conversation people are excited to have, but it's very productive because marketing has an immediate problem. Going back to Adelina's point, it, it's, uh, it's not a problem that isn't passed. How did this happen? It's like, I have a problem today. I'm trying to make my video. And you are accountable for this thing. Team, not necessarily an individual human, but the, the team is accountable. And I want to see what you're doing about this. And they might come back and say something like, well, we didn't even know you were working in that area. That's not what we're trying to tune. How can we tune that? They might come back and say, we're working on this other um, uh, more important issue. Here's why it's more important. That discussion, just as Simon's been saying throughout this, the discussion is the most important thing that happens, uh, whether or not you resolve that particular item, whether or not you uh, improve that particular metric. But I'd rather have the team accountable for it and I want the mechanism in place for them to be accountable frequently. So maybe uh, we're coming toward the end here, Simon. I want to ask you one final question. But before that, uh, my, my new penultimate question is, how are you keeping those um, indicators front and center? What, what mechanism is in place that keeps people updating them? Or, or are you not? We're not doing it as much as we should. But mm. and we're, what I think we're going to do to try and make them more vis visible is start talking about them in sprint reviews which by the way, we, we broadcast internally. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the appropriate time to say, look, observe the dial, we moved it here. Um, I think that's probably the best way to do it. On accountability, another thing that we've done here is racy matrixes and all of that stuff. I think RACI, bit... responsible, accountable, something, I can't remember what they all stand for, yeah. Okay, but, keep going. But, but one of, one of the constraints of racy is that there's only one person that can be accountable for. And, but I'd much rather have a team be accountable and that kind of breaks racy. So meh. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's an example of some bureaucracy that may not be helping you. Maybe you should get me to help you with that. But um, the <laughs> most important thing here is that uh, you have a mechanism by which the team can be accountable. And I like the notion that it's happening at a sprint review, which I assume is uh, every sprint. So every week or two weeks, however long your sprints are. How long are two weeks? Okay. So every fortnight, there's something that happens that causes people to say, hey, we got to go measure those things again. And did we actually move them? I would want that more frequent, uh, but I'm, I'll take every two weeks. So that's a, certainly a good start. Um, and I'd want to make sure that there was a mechanism by which those folks were accountable, perhaps to you, Simon. Um, but that you are not the one who has to run around and remind them. So the thing that I like to do is to say, uh, look, there, there needs to be some kind of reporting mechanism, kind of like me weighing myself every morning um, that so that I can uh, report. In that case, I'm reporting to myself on how I'm doing on my weight loss. But uh, it, it can be in, in this case that they're reporting to you. They're accountable for it. And they're giving the account to you rather than you coming around saying, have you done it? Have you done it? Have you done it? Where is it? They need to come to you and you notice it when they don't. And, and mm -hmm. you notice it when there's a gap. But that's much more efficient with your time and a much better way for an executive like you to, to keep track of what's happening over many teams as you are doing. So many times, though, I see uh, folks, uh, especially if they've been coming up through the ranks, they, they have uh, not been an executive for, for a terribly long time. They think, well, what I need to do is just do three times as much as what I used to do. So when I was a team lead, I needed to do it for one team. Now I need to do everything the same for three teams. No. What you want to do is make sure that the um, accountability comes from them. They're, they are making sure that it happens. You are the recipient, and you are the person who gives the feedback. Turn the ship around, maybe. Uh, this is the. Uh, that's certainly one of many things that uh, one of many uh, sources for these uh, kinds of ideas. Um, oh, Andy was reminding us: uh, responsible, accountable, consulted, informed. Excellent. Uh, glad our community knows what these things stand for. You can tell what. Um, level of respect I have for them. They're useful ideas. I don't want to be hidebound by them. The key thing for me is somebody is regularly coming back to Simon and saying, here's our results. So Simon, the concrete thing I might do, here's a little free coaching everybody can watch for Simon. The thing I might do is say, uh, everybody, I want you to spend five minutes with me every two weeks, and I want you to go through your uh, metrics with me. And I'm going to put it in the diary here so that I know that you're going to gather together at this time and give me that information. That's going to make sure that there's a recurring action, which is already matching up to what they're doing, and they are coming to give you an account. 
I think that's because I, I was that's very relevant because I was pushing this and it almost got pinged back to me from the team like, hey, you should be keeping these dashboards up to date. No, um, no, no, no. no. <laughs> They've got backwards. Absolutely yeah. not. Yeah. There, there's a great story, which is in uh, Agile Conversations, my book with Jeffrey. Um, the uh, sheriffs back in the time when my house was built in the 1450s and before, uh, they uh, sheriffs were not kind of Wild West people. They were people who were tax collectors. And they had to come to London once a year, kind of like once a sprint. It was a little harder to get around in those days. And um, they would bring bags of silver pennies and they would count them out kind of like reconciliation, actually. They would be counting out the pennies in, on the exchequer. That's where we get the notion of the exchequer in, in Britain. And um, they, they go to a special table called the exchequer, and they would count it all out and measure that they had collected their correct amount of taxes. So it was their job to come to London. The king didn't go around to all of them and say, have you collected the taxes? They had to come to London. And if, if they didn't, they could get their heads chopped off because they were probably pocketing it. So um, it, we don't worry about quite that level of consequence for uh, accountability these days. But the, the notion and accounting, that's where it comes from, counting out the, 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 the money from, from the sheriffs, that notion is still very helpful that they are uh, responsible. They are the ones who need to come to you with the, um, uh, with the accounting and you then give them feedback on how they're doing, help them, give them more resources, um, tell them when they perform well or not, or help them uh, address it. So put it in there, where, but, uh, court, but you make sure it actually happens. You're the one checking. So uh, there's some suggestions about how to execute your technology strategy. Uh, we're at the time we planned. Uh, uh, it's just flown by and, and fantastic questions uh, from, from everyone here. Thank you for coming along and listening and, and being part of this. Uh, as I say, the Squirrel Squadron is where you can uh, find out more about all these uh, things and come to more such events. So um, uh, I'm putting that up now so you know where to find uh, uh, the squadron if you're watching this uh, today or later. Um, uh, there you can f go to the forum post, which will come up after this. Uh, we'll have this recording, of course, up on the forum. But also, I'll have some of the ideas we came up with and, and links to more um, resources and ideas. We can discuss it further there. Uh, and I'd love, if anybody isn't in the squadron, to come along, join. You can be at more of these events, get my weekly emails, um, be on the forum, and discuss with um, fantastic people like Simon. And um, would love to see all of you on the 22nd, anybody who's in London, uh, 22nd of June, uh, 4.30 p.m., but show up early and ask questions uh, or come along to uh, play with chat GPT with me. Uh, and Simon, thank you so much for being a guest here. I, I had no idea that you'd done quite this much with what we did in the workshop. So um, very, very pleased uh, that you got good results. Don't be a stranger, okay? Tell me how this keeps on working for you and ask more questions on the forum and elsewhere. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Fantastic. Thanks so much, everybody. Have a wonderful day. Take care.